Just another reminder that we have membership class next week if you'd like to join us for that. We're going to continue on in our uh, sermon series, Knowing Jesus uh, Through the Old Testament. And uh, I was talking with people about, you know, should we have church today or not? And I said, well, if we have church, I will try to make it a little bit shorter and not go through the whole Old Testament again. So <laughs> we'll try to get you home safe and in one piece, okay? But we were talking about um, why do we need the Old Testament to understand Jesus? And we were reminded that the Old Testament is, in fact, the story that Jesus, what? He completes that story. So all this story from the Old Testament, from the beginnings of Genesis to the end of, of Micah, right, is all leading up to Jesus. And Jesus comes in, and he brings this story to its final climax. It is the end point. And uh, we are reminded in Matthew 1 that this is the genealogy, or the Genesis, from the very beginning. This is Jesus' story. And Jesus the Messiah, the one who was prophesied about, the son of David, the kingdom of God that was promised to King David, he is that king. The son of Abraham, he is the blessing to the nations that was promised to Abraham, right? And so Matthew continues to, and tries to make that point yet again. He says, thus there were 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. Right? And so Matthew makes that his kind of, this is what the Old Testament is in three sentences. And all of you are like, why couldn't you have done that last week, Pastor Luke? But, you know, whatever. So we're going to try this game again. I'm going to do, uh, name that section of the Bible where it's at. If you think it's in Abraham to David, you can do it with your friends there, your neighbors, see who's the better Christian. And uh, point up one, one, two, or three. And if you don't feel like playing, that's okay. You just give it your very best yes in your head. All right? So, Psalm 51. Would that be Abraham to David? King David to the exile to Babylon? Or the exile to the Messiah? Psalm 51. Well, we know that Psalm 51 was written by who? David. King David. And he was the king at that time. He wrote it after he did what? It's with uh, Bathsheba, that bad, bad guy, right? So that's number two, right? Two. All right, Gideon fights with 300 men. Is that one, Abraham to David, King David to the exile, or the exile to the Messiah? Well, Gideon is a what? Starts with a J. He's a judge. So first books of the Bible, then judges. So that's in the period of Abraham to David. Nehemiah rebuilds the wall. That is, everybody want to say it all together? We'll see what we can get. Number three. three. Wow, good job. Very good. He rebuilds the wall. All right, Joshua and the Battle of Jericho is number one. One. Good job. Okay. Queen of Sheba visits Solomon. That is number Two, yes, good job. All right, Ezra rebuilds the temple. Number three, okay. Very good. All right, so we realize that Jesus is the story, the Old Testament is the story that Jesus completes. And so we realize that this story has been leading up to him, and he completes it. But we also need to understand that the Old Testament is the story that Jesus fulfills. Right? Which is a little bit different than completes it. Right? You know, you think about um, the journey. If, uh, you know, last year we went to um, Disneyland, and that was a lot, or, okay, Disney World. And uh, we were in Florida, right? And we got on the plane and we went, and it took us a long time to get there, but we finally got there. And we made the journey there. And when we got to the gate, we had our tickets and we turned around and we went home, right? No, right? The whole purpose of the journey was to experience Disney World, right? And see Mickey Mouse and all the wonderful creatures of the world, right? All that stuff, right? It was to experience that. And so the story isn't just uh, Jesus finishes the story, but the whole story is about 
Jesus and him fulfilling. He is the point of the story. And Matthew goes into um, great detail about how Jesus fulfills this story. Matthew shows that Jesus as the fulfillment of the Old Testament. In Matthew, there is about, I think, like 16 times it talks about fulfillment or uses the word fulfillment. And it might be like 13 where Jesus is being shown as a fulfillment. There is an example there, Matthew 21, 4. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet, right? That's kind of the language that Matthew uses. And so he's showing that Jesus isn't just this brand new character that has nothing to do with the Old Testament, but that the Old Testament, this whole time, was pointing towards Jesus and what his life and, uh, and his ministry was all about. Now you think about this word, fulfill. And I looked it up and I took a screenshot on my phone there. To bring completion or reality, to achieve or realize. And what are you realizing or achieving or a completion of what reality? Something that is desired, promised, or predicted. Right? Something that's desired, promised, or predicted. And so, uh, oftentimes I hear um, this language, which isn't bad language, but I want us to think about this a little bit more. Is the Old Testament making predictions, or is the Old Testament making promises? Is the Old Testament making predictions, or is the Old Testament making promises? Well, you're like, well, who cares? What's the difference, right? Potato, potato, tomato, gelato, right? What, what's the matter? Well, predictions, right, are made about someone, right? So I'm going to predict something about someone or something, right? But promises are made to someone. Ooh. Huh? Yeah, let's all just say that together. Predictions are made about someone. Promises are made to someone. Now we can go home. No. All right, so think about this. Uh, uh, let's see. In Isaiah 44, there is a prediction made. All right? Uh, let's see. Isaiah 44, 28. Who says, Cyrus, he is my shepherd and will accomplish all that I please. He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt. And of the temple, let its foundations be laid. So this is a prediction about who? Cyrus, right? Well, 200 years later, what happens? The Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation through his realm. Any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem and Judah to build the temple of the Lord. That's pretty crazy, right? That's incredible. 200 years later, this prediction comes true. Which is, in and of itself, incredible, right? But if we think of the Old Testament, or even other books of the Bible, as predictions to be accomplished, when the t prediction takes place, what's it matter to us? Because once it's done, right, it's over, the Old Testament made its predictions. It happened. Okay, that's nice to know. It's kind of useful. I know I should probably listen to God because he knows what's going to be in the future. Right? But that would mean that this isn't really useful anymore because it's already happened. The prediction's taken place. But there's a difference between a prediction, which does take place in the Old Testament as well, but there's also the promise. Right? What's the promise in this? He says to Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt, and of the temple, let its foundations be laid. This is a promise to the Israelites who are in exile that there will be a day that you will return home. And that means that God is making a promise with the people, a covenant that he has had in place, not only in the time of exile, but it's the same covenant that he made with David, that he made with the people of Israel, that he made with Abraham, right? 
He made a covenant relationship with them saying, I am going to be with you, I promise, to the end. Right? And so in this, he has promised them that one day you guys are going to return home. I am going to stay in relationship with you to make sure that that promise takes place. 200 years later, in the book of Ezra, chapter 1, it takes place. Right? God is faithful to the relationship, and he is faithful to the promise that he made in that relationship. Isn't that better than a prediction? Yes. Right? Way better. And so we come in, and we are reminded that predictions are made about someone, promises are made to someone. God is making promises to a people. Right? And now we get into the New Testament, and what does Paul say about Jesus? He says this in 2 Corinthians 1.20. For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. Jesus is what was promised to us. Right? And, you know, it's interesting the different ways that we can look at that. And, uh, you know, Matthew, in the first two um, chapters... Right? He's talking about all the ways that Jesus' birth completes all these promises. But as they were predictions, you know, you can think about the first one. And he shall be called what? Emmanuel. Now, does that mean that the prediction is wrong? Because Jesus' name wasn't Emmanuel. What was Jesus' name? Jesus, right? So, huh. Is that a wrong prediction? Or is it a promise that comes true? It's a promise that is fulfilled. And you're like, well, it doesn't sound exactly what I was promised. If you were uh, born in a certain century, right, and your father promised you a horse when you turned 21, let's say, right, and what would be the point of the horse at that time? It would be for transportation. But then there's this person called Henry Ford, right? And he makes this thing, and it's a new automobile car, right? And you just happen to be at that place where your father can afford the car, right? And you turn 21, and guess what he gets you? He gets you a car. He doesn't get you a horse. He gets you a car. Is the promise fulfilled? Yes. It's at a different level. It's at a different, because the, the promise is, I am going to help you get transportation. And what's even better is, this level of promise is even greater than the first. Right? Does that make sense? God is fulfilling the promises. It is different, though, than the historical reality of what they were expecting. What were they expecting of King Jesus to look like? What was this Messiah supposed to be? I'm the king, right? That's the prediction. The promise is he is the Messiah who comes and is veiled, right? In the washing of the feet. He's on the throne, vindicated at the cross, right? It's different than what we're to, It's a different level of the promise that nobody anticipated. And if you're looking for predictions, and it's not going to be correct, but if you're looking towards the promise, oh, God is faithful. Huh? Pretty good, huh? It's incredible. So, Jesus fulfills these promises. Fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. Abraham said, you are going to be a blessing to the nations. Is Jesus a blessing only to the Israelites? No, to the Gentiles too, which I think is everybody in here, I'm pretty sure, right? To the nations, promise fulfilled, a resounding yes. When we look at the life of the Exodus, that it wasn't just in slavery to uh, physical bondage, which is still part of the gospel, 
but it's also a, a, a new exodus from our sinful nature, from our sinful selves, right? The promise is a fulfillment of a resounding yes in Christ. That the law is not something of a yes and no, but it's within our hearts because of what Christ has done. He is the fulfillment of the law that he tells us in the Sermon on the Mount. I am the fulfillment of the law. Right? A resounding yes in Christ. He is uh, the greatest sacrifice that we see within the tabernacle. All these things were pointing to it. It says they are shadows of the reality of what Jesus would do. Right? He is the ultimate sacrifice. A resounding yes. He is the king that, that, that uh, God promised David. A resounding yes. His presence that was represented in the temple was made complete in Jesus. A resounding yes. Yes, Israel and Judah, which were torn apart because of their own choices and power struggles. But God in Jesus Christ has made it possible for us not only to be right with him, but for us to get back right with each other. A resounding yes. Right? And all these things are pointing to Jesus. And Paul says, every promise of God is a resounding yes in Jesus. These are not just predictions, as fun as that is to do, right? With your little coder, decoders, and all that stuff, right? But it's much more. His predictions, they tend to be impersonal, right? You know, I can make a prediction about somebody. They might not ever know it. And if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. It doesn't really change anything. But when I stand before God and the people at my wedding, and I make a promise to that woman over there, I'm going to have in the hold, thicker, or whatever, you know, richer or poor, all those things. I was better when I had to repeat it. <laughs> but all those things, I'm making a promise, right? That's very personal. Right? I'm promising this person for life. And I can't make a prediction of what that's going to look like. Right? But the promise is still a yes. And Jesus made a covenant, a new covenant in which he and us are bound together in relationship where he makes the promises. And the thing about promises also is that it requires a response. Right? I wasn't the only one who vowed that day. Bethany also vowed to me. And the rest of 2 Corinthians goes like this. 2 Corinthians 1.20 For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. And through Christ, our amen, which means yes, ascends to God for his glory. So the promises of Jesus are yes, and our response, because of what Christ has done, is to be yes, not for our glory, but for whose glory? To God's glory. And so I think sometimes we have this poor idea that, well, the Old Testament was about the law and a list of do's and a list of don'ts. And the New Testament, thanks be to God, is about God's grace. Right? But that does not show the character of God at all. Jesus is fulfilling what the Old Testament was talking about. And so you must use both of them together. Can I get uh, okay, that on the next slide? Right, that they are interconnected together. You think about the Exodus story, right? And we think about Mount Sinai, and we think about Moses going up there, and he has the law, and we know that thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. We're like, oh man, okay, we, there's a lot to do nots here that we're not supposed to do. Thank be to God that we have Jesus now, right? <laughs> Amen. We don't have to follow all those laws. 
And thank goodness that we have, are in the realm of grace. But what chapter does the Ten Commandments come in in Exodus? Anybody know? Chapter 20. Chapter 20! And you guys are biblical scholars. If chapter 20 is where it comes in, how many chapters then is there before the law takes place? 19! Okay, yeah, 19 whole chapters, right? And what has God been up to and all this before he gives them the law? He's been getting them out of Egypt. And he didn't say, all right, everybody listen up. I got these Ten Commandments. And before I yank yourselves out of here, out of Egypt, you're going to obey every single one of these commandments before I pull you out. And if you don't do it, well, guess what? You're staying here. No. It was God's gracious initiative that went before, before the law. He went after his people and he got them out. He freed them so that they may worship him. Right? It wasn't, you're going to obey these laws, and if you do that, then I'm going to bring you freedom. No, I'm going to bring you freedom. In response to that, we're going to be in a covenant promise relationship. And I am saying yes to you, and I want you to say yes to me back. But even when they don't, it doesn't change the fact that God was gracious in his initiative first. God is always gracious. And so if we think in our mind, okay, if God is the one who brings redemption and then the law, and we think that Jesus is just about the grace, whoa, 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 whoa. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament, right? So he is the same God. So it doesn't mean that we just be scot-free. I got my Jesus sin card that I get to stamp every single day because, well, I like the sin. But Jesus, thank God, Die on the cross for me. No. Right? We respond to him and to his promises by saying yes back for his glory. He shows his grace by rescuing us before he gives us the law, before he shows us what it is to fully live like Christ. But our response is to be in obedience to Jesus, right? And so the Old Testament isn't contradictory to the new, and the new isn't contradictory to the old. The answer is yes in Jesus. Friends, all the promises of God are yes in Jesus. And the question is for you today, are you responding to the promises of God in your own life with a yes. I want everybody to bow your head and close your eyes. And I want you to think about your life right now. Is there anything in your life that you would say, this is mine, I haven't given it to the Lord. And if it is, that means that you're saying, a resounding no to Christ. That no, I got this. I don't need you. No, this is mine. But Christ has called us to answer back with a resounding yes, not for our glory, but for his glory. And the same God who takes the initiative, and in his grace, even makes this an option, friends, is the same God who will give you the grace to live this type of life, that we can say yes to him over and over again. You cannot do it on your own. It is by grace that you are saved, and it is grace that continues to save you. It is the grace that continues to help you to be obedient to Christ. You be willing today to turn that no into a yes for him. It's going to take a few moments right now. If you want to come up to the altar, is that
that'd be fine, that's appropriate. If you just want to stay in your seat, that's fine. I just want to take a few moments for us to just reflect and ask God, is there anything in my life that I'm saying no to you? Lord, I want to make it a yes today. Take us some time. God, we love you. We thank you so much for this day. God, we thank you for your grace that speaks to us when we're off course. And the grace that you give us to get back on course. And the grace you give us to stay on course. So, Lord God, we just say we need your help, Jesus. Will you help us to say yes to you in response to the grace that you've given us, in response to all the ways that your promises have remained true. Lord, may we say yes to you. Back to you, Lord, in our life, in our home, and in our community. And to your name we pray. Thank you so much. You are dismissed. Thank you.